Good afternoon and thank you for joining us here at our What's a Home Brown Bag Lunch. We're going to talk about how space is important to an applied theatre company like New Hampshire Theatre Project. We're delighted that you're joining us here during New Hampshire Gives. I'm Catherine Stewart, I'm the Artistic Director at New Hampshire Theatre Project and I'm joined by Genevieve Achel, our Founding Executive Director and Janice Hastings, our Marketing Director. So, Jen, lead us on a journey down memory lane. Uh, has New Hampshire Theatre Project always been located at 959 Islington Street? No, we have not. Um, yes, so New Hampshire Theatre Project really began as a, a collaborative of artists um, who we primarily toured um, to schools and communities, and um, that was uh, in 1978, it was called Kitchen Sink Productions. And then um, 10 years later, we incorporated as New Hampshire Theatre Project in 1988. And we still didn't have a home of our own. And um, so we didn't come to um, 959 Islington Street until about until 15 years ago. So if you're ready to go on a journey, I will take you on the journey of the many homes of a New Hampshire Theatre Project. So I'm gonna share my screen here. So, um, as I said, we were Kitchen Sink Productions, also Kitchen Sink Mime Theater um, back in the day. Uh, this has been a very unbelievable journey for me, I will tell you. Uh, and I have to say, uh, for those of you listening out there, some of this might not be in order because it's been over 40 years and I don't remember everything. Um, whoops. Okay, whoops. All right, okay. <laughs> so, um, so it all started on Highland Street in Portsmouth. And uh, my former husband, Dennis McLaughlin, and I lived in this apartment on the second floor. And we had a very tiny room. It was not much bigger than a closet. And that was really our office. We um, operated out of that space for, for many, many years. Packed with files. Yes, it was packed with files <laughs> along with lots of other theater paraphernalia. Um, we had a, a whole costume collection in our basement, I remember too. Um, and this was our first um, actual space. So this was in the old post office building. It's now the book and bar, you can see. Um, we were up on the third floor. Uh, it was a beautiful, beautiful space. I actually found one old picture, yes, <laughs> from those oh, days. Wow. <laughs> um, oh my goodness. Big windows. Yes, mm -hmm. and uh, the brick walls, and there, there were beautiful red tile floors. Um, it, the space we were in had uh, been, um, Pontine had been in there, Pontine Theater, <clears throat> and they shared it with the Scatequa River Jazz Dancers, and then Pontine moved over to Market Square Studio, and we, um, we moved in. And um, this is uh, Market Square Studio, which was above well, I can't remember what it is now. Tuscan Market, is that, that's what it is now. It's changed hands. I go back to Cafe Brioche and Teddy's Lunch. Right. Um, but um, this was a Pontine's studio and theater, and they rented it out to a lot of performers. It was hotter than hell. That's what I remember. <laughs> and uh, yeah. our first kind of full-length production that we did um, was uh, of Waiting for Gatto. And it was done in the space that I just remember it was June and it was so, so hot and the production was three hours long. And <laughs> we, we, we actually did that show twice since then, but this was the first time. Um, and I'm not sure if we actually, if this is in the right order, this is where my memory gets a little blurry. But at one point we ended up having to leave the old post office building. We moved down to Daniel Street. Um, this is where, um, I think down here is where, uh, what was in there, Pro um, Provident Bank, I think? Was just yeah, it was, yeah, yeah, it was a bank. Yeah. But this was up on this third floor, and we shared this space with the Portsmouth Fabric Company. Oh, and so they would have um, uh, sewing classes on Monday and Wednesday evenings, and then we had uh, movement and acting classes on you know Tuesdays and Thursday evenings. And again, the, I just remember the beautiful windows and the lights here. I think these are all condos now. But um, the other memory I have of that space was uh, Gretchen, who owned Portsmouth Fabric Company, had these beautiful uh, wooden tables that they would use for cutting, for sewing. 
and they were off in one corner and we used them to sort the bulk mail because this was the days before you know <laughs> computers and so we had to sort everything by hand into the zip codes and to this day i know the zip codes of every town in new hampshire because of those those tables um so while we were in these spaces we performed at a number of different spaces this was the bow street theater when it was new uh, when it was run by theater by the sea and um, we performed there. We also did a lot of shows at Prescott Park. So this was back in the early days when we were doing um, Mime and um, that's Prescott Park. And, uh, and then this is Prescott Park in the, the uh, 90s, I guess. This was our, it was um, the rustic show from Midsummer Night's Dream, the, the tragedy of Pyramus and Thys Thysbe. And uh, so that's me and Andrew Schwartz and Dennis McLaughlin. Um, I don't remember what the set was. The sets were much simpler back in those days. Um, so then we decided we really wanted a space of our very own. And so we moved, this is on South Street in Portsmouth. This was an old um, car repair shop. And so we spent weeks and weeks um, sanding all the grease and gunk off of the floor and polishing it and painting. And um, this is when I, after this experience, I vowed I would never do a wallboard again. Um, I did it again when we moved to uh, 959, but um, this is now all uh, condos. But um, these are some pictures <laughs> of that space. So you can see that I'm looking at that floor, <clears throat> how shiny it was. And uh, Colleen Linehan reminded me recently of um, we all, a bunch of us <clears throat> had polyurethane the floor. And then we went out for coffee. And then we went to see The Shining. <laughs> and we were all <laughs> so high from the polyurethane <laughs> and the caffeine. I heard that movie just terrified me to this day. I can't watch it because <laughs> that moment when they're coming in, the helicopter is like, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> that's what this comes back. So, um, and up above us was uh, Studio 139, which was uh, Cheryl Berman's ballet studio. So we, they used the ups, upstairs space. Uh, but then <clears throat> they decided to turn that into condo. So we moved back to Highland Street. Um, we uh, rented the front room here of this apartment. So it was separate from our living space. And uh, because we actually had staff by then, uh, Mimi Berger and a couple of other people. So um, that was our office. And then once again, we performed at many other spaces. Um, we finally moved out again to, this is out um, on Morona Road. It used to be called Artisan Outlet because um, it was, um, the Levinson family owned it and they kindly gave us a space. Um, knew eventually they were going it, but for a year it was empty. I was um, smiling because I took this recently, but it was not handicapped accessible when we were there, which was one of the reasons why we knew it couldn't be permanent space for us, but we loved it out there. It was, that was a beautiful space. <laughs> um, this is uh, one of the places we performed. Pontine moved from Market Square to McDonough Street. And this used to be the old uh, McDonough Street um, Theater. And um, again, I'm reminiscing my <laughs> memories. We were doing uh, Mad Woman of Shio with the Youth Repertory Company. And um, the, the, uh, there was an old freight elevator and I had a huge truckload of costumes and I got stuck in the freight elevator. It's stuck. <laughs> and I have claustrophobia. So, uh -huh. <clears throat> it was me and those costumes in that elevator for I don't remember how long, um, but we we had a lot of fun in that studio. Many many people uh, shared that space um, thanks to Marguerite and Greg. And um, my, what another memory we were producing a show. I don't remember the name of it, but it was a woman who had been a police officer in New York, and she was also a performance artist. So she had created this show. And at one point she was talking about gunshots and these, this terrible boom started and we were, the whole audience was terrified because they were, these were such realistic sound effects. It turned out there were actually fireworks going on somewhere. I think it might've been Market Square Day and we didn't remember that, but uh, so, many, so many memories of this space. 
Um, we also did some at the Women's City Club, which has a beautiful uh, meeting space. And um, I think this was actually when we were back on, on Highland Street, because mm -hmm. this was right around the corner. So we would just walk set pieces and costumes over. Um, we did, I don't know if you remember, Janice, the Spring Flings. I was just going to say, we did both a Christmas one and a Spring Fling. Well, no, the Christmas one. No, the one. Christmas one was at the Masonic. Yeah, that's coming up, yes. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. 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 So the Spring Flings were these just yep. hilarious fundraisers fun. that we had. Yeah. It's a beautiful um, space. We did a lot of things on the Little Harbor stage. Um, we premiered, I think the first show that New Hampshire Theatre Project officially produced was uh, Hey Penny Theatres along the Boomerang Coast and uh, with Pat Spaulding and David Tesler. And um, so we used the stage at Little Harbor for that. Well, then um, we moved to the Delahaye Center, um, which was owned by the Delahaye Company. This was on Islington Street. We started slowly moving out of town. And uh, this was a beautiful space. Um, we had an office on the second floor and then we had the whole third floor was a, a studio. It was very uh, wonderful space. Um, and we were there for a year or so and then there was an issue with, we were subletting and there was an issue with the landlord and the person we were subletting with. Um, so we had to leave that sadly. Um, and then we moved to um, <laughs> 800 Plaza, Plaza 800 on Islington Street further down. And uh, we were above the Cleary Cleaners, the laundromat up there. But we had a nice nice uh, studio and some office space. Um, it's fun, interesting to see the Frank Jones building because that was all just deserted you know, when we were there. Um, it's so great that it's all been fixed up now. Um, yes, there's the Masonic there's Temple. We had the infamous Red Stocking Jubilee there, which was uh, <laughs> a 1940s radio show uh, fundraiser. And then a lot of local uh, visual artists made stockings and we auctioned them off. That was a, a really fun, uh, fun event. Um, so at some point, and I, again, my memory blurs because there was a point where we were moving every year and we would just walk everything places. Um, we had to leave the laundry uh, the laundry, <laughs> and we were going to move over to Mall House Exchange, but there was a, we had this in between time. So Mary Griffin, who was the owner of uh, Plaza 800, the Griffin family, they were so, every, people were so kind to us. Um, we moved over, um, I believe it was this, this space. It was just temporary and we just had all our stuff crammed in there in a tiny little office space. Um, and then eventually we moved to the Malt House Exchange and we shared um, I believe it was the space where the escape room is now. Um, we shared space with the Portsmouth Center for Yoga and the Arts with Jeannie Russell. And uh, she sadly, just because of the mm. COVID-19 crisis has decided to close her studio, which was moved to a different spot than it is here. But while we were there, that was when we, um, we did performances, um, both with the youth company and um, neighborhoods which was done in, in one. So um, we used the stage at the Methodist Church, which was on Miller Avenue. Um, again, we were back at Little Harbor. And um, I, I have to tell one story um, about neighborhoods. There was a, a boy who went to Little Harbor and um, he, uh, he used to come to the things we did on McDonough Street and just kind of hang out there. And uh, I, I he was like a street kid, which there aren't a lot of in Portsmouth. But I remember people used to ask me, why do you just let him in? He doesn't pay. And I said, oh, you know, I just want him here because he's not on the street. And he was, eventually he was in neighborhoods and uh, heralded by the entire cast. But the story is that um, the, the uh, guidance counselor at the school told me that she asked him, you know, I'm not, I don't want to say his actual name, but why aren't you, uh, you're not getting into trouble anymore. You know, you used to get into fist fights and you're in, and what's changed? And he said, oh, I'm an actor now. I know different ways to express my feelings. Wow. And um, I still see this young man every once in a while. <laughs> He's amazing. all grown up and I don't think he lives there anymore, but um, it's just my, my great memory of neighborhoods in Little Harbor. Um, then we also performed at the music hall, um, 
this was a, an older picture, obviously. It's quite fixed up and beautiful now. Um, and we did our uh, youth repertory company performances of uh, Macbeth and um, the birds there, of course, neighborhoods, and then later um, the Knights of the Kitchen Tables, or Knights of the Square Tables, that was it, um, right. which we was a collaboration with Ballet Theater Workshop. Mm -hmm. And um, and I wanted to thank, thank Dennis Robinson because he uh, loaned me this old photograph. A little plug for his book about the music hall, which is quite wonderful. Um, so I yeah, just want to give a shout out to Dennis and thank you. So then, a theater of our own. We spent a um, number of years with the board, the artists, and talking about that it was great to be a nomadic theater and and there was a certain freedom in that, but we'd never be able to actually become um, a strong organization. We, it was difficult to raise money without a space of our own, without a, a, a brick and mortar place, as they say, that people could identify with New Hampshire Theater Project. And of course, you know, space in Portsmouth is very difficult to find. It was then too. Um, this is in the late 90s. Um, but because of our connection with the Music Hall and the Shipyard Project, we had um, worked closely with the Department of Morale, Welfare, and Recreation in the Navy. And they suggested that we become a resident company. The Shipyard has a 400-seat proscenium theater there that isn't really used. So we spent a year negotiating with the Navy and, uh, I don't know, a multitude of lawyers. And on August 26, 2001, we signed the agreement. And then three weeks later, September 11th happened, the war clause kicked in and everything was off. And um, it's interesting, this building here, because I just took this recently. I mean, this is the second gate of the shipyard. This building did not exist then. That was built after 9-11 to make the base more secure. And um, because the theater was located very close to the high security section where they repaired the submarines, it just, we were not able to ever go back in there. We did rehearse some, um, I have not yet begun to fight Jim Kelly's play about uh, John Paul Jones there. And then that was eventually performed at the music hall. But after that, um, we had moved so many times and we were so drained as a company, we had put all of our resources into this that we made the decision we were gonna finish our teaching season. We were still sharing the space at the Malthouse Exchange and that we would, um, in June, we were gonna disband as an organization. Everyone was just too exhausted. And then in May, I got a call from Marjorie Matthews of Pontine that um, Bill Truslow and Kelly Davis had a space and they were offering it to them. They couldn't take it alone. Would we consider um, moving into the space with them? And that was the West End Studio Theater. Um, so, you know, this was just an empty space and we built this theater. I, uh, I say uh, Greg and Marguerite from Pontine and Blair Hunter, Mark and I, uh, along with a cast of thousands, but we were, we, <laughs> we used to start, we, we would teach classes in the middle of a construction zone. We would have like two carpet squares and a couple of lamps and we would still hold our theater classes. And then eventually our first production was Moby Dick, I still remember that. Um, the Orson Welles play. And uh, so we've been there ever since. And then uh, two years ago, Pontine moved out and we raised the money for um, the theater seats and for lights. And it became our space. We're waiting, this space is empty here because, whoops, oh, well, there's the space, but we're, we're gonna have our name up on the building that's in progress. But this is the, our little black box theater, 959, which we're very sad right now. The doors are closed, the lights are off, but we hope they will be on again soon. And um, we just got a new sign. <laughs> so that is the story of our journey. Um, and I may have even missed a few spaces. I did, these are only the spaces in Portsmouth. I mean, we performed at the Mill Pond Center in Durham. And of course, since we were touring, we performed, you know, all over the state of New Hampshire. So 
Um, but that's our story. So it, it sounds, in hearing about these spaces, it sounds like there's always been a need for the administrative space, the office space, and the, the uh, artist space, rehearsal space, performance space. Um, what did it mean to come to a space like 959 where, where all of that is, is now under one, under one roof? What does it mean to have space to teach, perform, and have someone working in the office all, all at the same time? Well, I would say we're still not completely under one roof because we have three different storage spaces, you know, for costumes and uh, set pieces and all of that. But I think it, um, it's really enabled us to become a more, I would say, coherent organization and, and to have many, multiple things happen at the same time I always think it's uh, it's wonderful when there's a couple different rehearsals going on and someone's you know making costumes in the back room and, and someone's uh, planning a fundraiser out in the you know out in the garden um, and there's there's kids in the lobby making things I mean that's just to me that's when everything is humming and buzzing and, and wonderful and um, we were never able to to do that um, we're also able to um, invite uh, donors and people who want to support us into our space. But I think the most important thing is that we talked about at our recent retreat with the board and the artists that creating a, a safe space for difficult conversations or art that is provocative, it, it requires that it be a safe space. and. Um, we've worked really hard to make this particular space a, a place that, that everyone is welcome. And when we were itinerant, we never really had that opportunity. Yeah. There's, I have a question. You were on much I, of the journey. Oh, <laughs> it's so funny. I'm not even sure which places I actually helped move. Mm -hmm. I, I know that I helped with a couple different moves. And I'm certain about the laundry. I was, because I remember the stairs. Um, and I was on the board when we signed the uh, shipyard space, which I, the conversations were about the artistic freedom that we would then have to be able to decide what productions and be versatile, have multiple things happening at the same time because the energy that it took to have, you know, office space one place and performing happening all over, there is a sense of freedom there, but it also was, there was a lot of energy output to make yeah. that happen. When you think about what you literally physically have to load in the car <laughs> to travel for a production was a piece of it. And I remember the, the financial conversations, thinking about what will a constant, versatile space that's consistent be able to do for us as an organization. And the hope had been that it would be easier for ticket sales, for just as one example of the financial piece of it. And I think if you fast forward all these years to 959, in the short time we were there, and had a couple of seasons, we saw that begin to happen, you know, to, to, to see the ticket sales from productions, um, at least break even, if not make a little money. Um, and I feel like that bricks and mortar piece, it's so, it's such an, uh, an interesting um, I don't know, study in opposites that you wouldn't think that being tied to a to a bricks and mortar space would give you more freedom and in a way it does which yeah. was so interesting i wonder if it really supports the diverse revenue streams that new hampshire theater project has and in that we know that we're a healthier organization because we have diverse revenue streams when when we really get down to the nuts and bolts of running uh 
an organization that is fiscally responsible and financially sound and and has a, a an eye towards growth and being able to have greater impact locally regionally statewide that that holding a space like this um as much as it has all the benefits for for the values that we hold dear in our programming that actually when you look at the balance sheet as well mm. it's part of um creating a robust organization that 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 wouldn't necessarily happen otherwise yeah, yeah i mean we went we basically went from uh I don't remember exactly, but I think our budget was about $60,000 a year to now it's a quarter of a million. Um, and we had no staff, um, it was all volunteer. I think we had one person who worked 10 hours a week that booked some of the touring performances. To, you know, we have four staff and 30 artists connected with our organization now. Um, when, we, when we shared the space, although there was a security to that, we were limited with our with our programming and branding was difficult. So um, it's really only been in the past two years that we've been able to claim the space and do all our own programming um, that we found that it's starting to um, to really reflect in the, the financial and infrastructure growth. Um, we would really like to own the space because that would give us even more freedom. You know, I've had uh, numerous conversations with uh, Russ Grazer over at PMAC and, um, you know, it's just, it's, it makes a great deal of difference when you own the space. So that's something that I think that um, if we're going to become a secure organization, really stable, that to know that this space is ours or a space is ours um, for the foreseeable future is going to be absolutely vital. Also in terms of, um, you know, we talk about wanting to serve lots of different people and kinds of people. That's and at the moment, 959 is accessible, but it's not really practical. In fact, I think we were voted the most accessible theater in Portsmouth. But there's so many things we would like to do to redo all the bathrooms to make the whole backstage more accessible. Um, and especially in light of COVID-19, those are things we're going to have to think very carefully about. Um, we've been talking about redoing the lobby so that it's more open, um, so that the space is more flexible for different things. Because, you know, um, we're not necessarily a proscenium theater. I mean, I personally, I would like to see it become more of a, a black box, which can be, a, a, we call it a black box, but it isn't right now because the seating is fixed. Yeah. Um, and that sometimes it might not be a theater at all, but a gathering place. Yeah, yeah. and uh, sorry, Janice, you, you spoke earlier to versatility and, and that that's in, in there as well. Um, yeah, sorry, Janice, on you go. And that's what I was going to say was that the versatility allows us very specifically to serve the community more intentionally and with what kinds of programming is needed at the moment, which I find that, you know, it's almost as if the metaphor of space becomes uh, the logistical reality that makes it possible to do that. And you wouldn't think that space would be so critical in meeting the needs of community. It, it, in a way, it's almost counterintuitive because if we're more nomadic and flexible, we can go to other people. And yet when you find for programming, what you're allowed to do to welcome people in, we don't have to think about the logistics, for example, of schedules of other people's spaces. And so we're able to program as the community and we agree that it is best. Yeah, I love. And our the communities that we form, you know, in relation to the conversation we had yesterday about how do the arts build community, right. the communities that we support, that we foster, that we uh, hold space for, that we are asked to help build, um, 
can happen on a one-on-one -on -one basis but it can also happen on a one to 50 basis, you know, right. um, or 50 people altogether. Um, and then everything in between that. And so it's almost the space has to live and breathe and grow and be bigger and be smaller. And, and we do that, we, we do that um, with some of the flexibility that we have right now, but it excites me to think about the future of how else we could do that if again we were we were able to um either own the space and make more adjustments or if as we move forward we we really think about the asset of space and mm. and how we might um let that breathe and grow because because again we we meet and create and and sit with many different sizes of communities that need many different kinds of spaces. You know, another aspect of the space that I think is really important, um, many, many years ago, when I was first um, organizing the Hampshire Theatre Project, I was, I was talking to Peggy Center, who runs the Concord Community Music School. And I asked her, you know, how have you managed to attract and keep so many talented teaching artists? Because, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking for artists who um, who have a commitment beyond just being an actor, say. And she said, you have to give them the opportunity to apply their own craft as well. And I think that one of the reasons why we've been able to attract um, what is 20 resident and company artists now is because we do have this um, beautiful little theater um, where they do have a chance to act or to direct or to design um, and that gives them the artistic inspiration to then go out and do artist in residence programs and to share with uh, communities beyond the space uh, it, it's difficult to be an artist and to constantly give if you are never fed so um, I think that's the, another thing I just just occurred to me actually that um, is really important and that was another driving force Janice I think along with the financial piece of course to us wanting uh, right wanting a space of our own a home yeah and the yeah. sense of artistic excellence and that you know as an organization we're leading with live theater um, and we're committed to artistic excellence and the craft of theater yeah. I'm just thinking of the most, most recently the niceties that you directed, I mean, which we were able to do in our space and then set it up for touring and take it to many, many places. And I don't think it, we certainly could have done that, but um, yeah. it was uh, a much more, um, I don't know, smooth and flowing process because we had our home base to operate from. Yes, and I think also in terms of that production, as you bring it up now, we worked uh, to to ensure that the conversation was an intimate conversation. We 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 knew that that our audience were several feet away from from two characters who were having an immensely difficult conversation, and that intimacy always seems so integral to the work we do at New Hampshire Theatre Project as well. It doesn't mean that we're not then able to to translate that to you know a, a 900 seat theatre which we did as we toured the work or or to, to a, a 500 seat theatre but it's the the kernel of that production was intimacy and in the current moment we can't necessarily be intimate with our audience in the way that we used to be so we have to think about how we can do that in the next few months in the next few years and then moving forward and how we can support audiences and individuals to be intimate in in new ways to to still feel connection when perhaps we need to be socially distant um, or as we hopefully might not need to be socially distant in the future, how do we hold space that, that allows people to move through that trauma 
at a pace um, that, is, that is safe and right for them. That's where our space feels so important to me because I know that in a time where we can't gather, coming together and gathering again is going to be a long journey of recovery and transformation from where we are now. And I, I just hope that our home can, can, can support the work that we need to do. Well, thanks for sharing lunch with me. <laughs> and uh, thank you to everyone for joining us for this conversation. We'd love to hear your views and thoughts on uh, what our home means to you. And so you can join the conversation on Facebook or on Instagram at NH Theatre Project. We are raising $10,000 in order to make a brand new piece of work right now. We don't know what this is yet through NH Gives. We hope that you can join us in celebrating the work that we've been doing for 30 years and the next 30 years by looking at making work right now, but also these kinds of conversations about what this organisation is doing. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.